Okay, this lesson is entitled The Anathema Alternative. In Galatians, Paul said, let the man who comes preaching a different kind of gospel, which he said is not another, so it's not a gospel at all, let him be accursed. And it's difficult to know what are the implications of that. So let's look at that word, look at the context, uh, context, context, context. Uh, there's a really good uh, Bible teacher out there. He says that a lot. And I was trained in a seminary, the seminary we call it. And if you were in systematic theology, you were taught the context. If you were in Bible language, Hebrew or Greek, you were taught the context. And if you were in hermeneutics especially, <laughs> you were taught the context. So let's look at this. Uh, this, ignore the Hebrew. Well, no, don't ignore it. If you're working on your Hebrew, that was from another class. I just placed this board up here because really I'm just not ready to take all that down yet. So let's get on with the lesson. The anathema alternative in 1 Corinthians 16, 22. If you've got your little gadget here, you can pull up your Bible app very quickly. And 1 Corinthians 16, 22, those of you that use this will be having, uh, actually, if you, the more you use this, the less you'll need to question anything. But it says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Again, that is uh, something very striking because we'll look, uh, it's the word befriending, befriending, and in that case, it's a present active imperative. Um, it says, um, let him be being continuously anathema again what would it what is it with jesus and this word anathema well that's exactly a category that in we would say a metonym that refers to numerous things and it, that those things would be implications uh, jesus was anathematized if you don't mind me uh, using that uh, in acts 5 30 for example when you look there and then we'll go to the word and see what we got here it says, it says, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. So they hanged him on a tree. So he was hanged on a tree. Galatians 3.13 says, everyone is, is hanged on a tree. It's cursed is everyone. He redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse. That means uh, imprecated. Uh, imprecatory prayers we've heard those before where you're praying a curse on someone Jesus prayed imprecatory prayers in the Psalms we could read those where from his viewpoint he was very much in a legitimate position to do that so now let's go to our text Galatians 1 8 and 9 and see what it means when we wish someone to be because it can be it's it's easy to just say let them be condemned or let them uh, go to hell. Some have even taught that, which is fine. It's just not really uh, a Christ-centered answer, which has greater implication than the person being in hell. Now, for that individual being judged or cursed and separated from God, that's one thing for them. But according to the scriptures, the implication is always first and foremost, how is this uh, effect or affect Christ? What's the effect on him? So if we look at it that way and we notice, let him be being, this is a present active imperative, continuous action. So there's a process here, a process, there we go, ongoing process, upwardly positioned. Now, according to what we know about anathema, when, for example, the Bible says he's the Lamb of God, so he was, according to the Old Testament, he's the elect one. I think it's in Isaiah 40. He's the elect that was selected. He's the sin bearer, the Lamb of God, the bearer. So he's the Lamb of God. And he, so as the one chosen, for example, uh, he was caged. He was caged. There's even the text talking about, uh, so a lamb, when that lamb was selected, it was literally caged because the next thing for it was to be positioned upwardly as a sacrifice. Well, Jesus was imprisoned, incarcerated, and then, of course, hanged on a tree. So Paul's argument 
which was on behalf of Christ. You remember he was an ambassador as we are ambassadors for Christ. Paul's argument was when he said it twice, he iterated it, saying again, even if an angel from heaven, or anyone comes preaching a different gospel, which is not another. So it doesn't exist. There's no, there's no such thing as two gospels. And this gospel that he was defending had to do with the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Well, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ was in, within the Godhead and the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. And Jesus came and even told John the Baptist it's necessary for us, the antecedent to us being the Godhead who, who dwelled, the fullness of which dwelled in him bodily. He said for us to fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus came as the elect one, as the Lamb of God that would bear the sin, take away the sin of the world. Of course, he fulfilled all righteousness. He fulfilled the law. Now we're not talking about the word keep, and adherent. We're talking about someone who filled it up. Now that means he filled, fulfilled all the law with all his heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. Loved his neighbor as himself with all his heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. Then he fulfilled all righteousness. That's the righteousness of God. So Jesus fulfilling it is the one who established it and defined it. So when we look at the life, death, burial, resurrection, the teachings, all that Jesus did as the just one, who died for the unjust as the sinless one who came into this world, the only one born into this world, willing and able to fulfill all the law, fulfill all righteousness, and to, by doing that, establish the righteousness of God. So what Paul was actually saying, and the full implication is, let him, the one who is supporting a different gospel that points to something less than the faithfulness of Christ as that alone out from which a man who trusts into him is declared right and is always being declared right. And that alone, which is that which establishes and defines the righteousness of God. So when we talk about the righteousness of God, it's, the, it's that which has been fulfilled, established, and now defined and on display. Paul even told the Galatians he had painted a picture of Christ down before their very eyes, uh, a picture according to Christ, so they couldn't miss it. And that's why he was so adamant. But when he said, let them be accursed, what are we really saying that would be stronger than just the demise of that particular individual? Well, he's calling back to if you're not satisfied with Jesus being anathematized, the process of Jesus from the time the Godhead um, planned to send him into this world and the time he came into this world and became flesh, according to John, the first chapter, the word came to be flesh, that word who was always being in beginning, the word who was always being toward the Father in beginning, the one who was always being God all the way back in beginning, as far back as you want to go, that one, that word, that logos, came to be flesh and dwelt among us. The one that when Moses said, who are you that I should, who should I tell them you are? What's your name? He said, I will become who I will become. Jesus is... The word is who and what was flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So from, from the time the Godhead planned that the Son would enter this world and redeem mankind, and he would be the kinsman redeemer, that is. And the time, so he's the elect one, he's the sin bearer, he was caged, he was hanged on a tree. And this is what... Uh, Paul was saying because his whole case would be uh, in the establishment. He would show it in Galatians 3.13. Let's just look there and then we'll end there because this is where it, it's, uh, this is why no kind of man is justified out from any kind of law because we aren't the elect one. We aren't willing nor able to fulfill the law. You should see us when we try to keep it. All it does is incentivize and incite in us motions of the flesh that find us uh, more inclined as Paul said he didn't know what it was to covet till the law said thou shalt not covet he said sin in him came alive and that was his descriptive language personifying sin as something enlivened and quickened by the law saying don't thou shalt not covet now that's a thought crime that's a a, a crime of the flesh it's uh, the Paul mentioned that being outside of Christ, being dead in sins and trespasses, he was one who was only always fulfilling the, the wills, plural, of both the mind and the flesh. So we have wills, plural, of the will of the flesh and the mind. 
And he was referring to that in Romans when he said the law told him thou shalt not covet. It aroused in him, incited in him that. So he says in 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, it actually says has been written and remains on record. That is the implications are still standing. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And that word there, uh, refers to imprecated, imprecated, as in uh, an imprecatory prayer, uh, the uh, wish for a judgment, a, a curse, a condemnation. So he was saying those who, like the legalists who came and wanted to nullify the faithfulness of Christ by somehow adding and importing, if you will, their act of circumcision, which that's what they happened to pick. They didn't really care about the law. The Bible says that Paul told us they weren't really keepers, guardians, caretakers, curators of law. They weren't like concerned about the integrity of the law, the, the knowledge of sin that the law gave, the fact that its purpose was to point everyone to Christ that was under that law. They, they weren't about that. They were just there so that getting them to go along with them would getting the Galatian believers, these churches there, assemblies in that southern region of Galatia, getting them to go along would be a show in their flesh. So Paul just, he was, the only thing he knew he could do is, he, is anyone does today. And when you appeal back to this, and today people that don't know what this is, uh, they don't know this is, this is a title, if you will, as far as we're concerned, of not only this in function, but of this one, Jesus, this one who was hanged on the tree, this one who, the just one for the unjust, the one who fulfilled the law, the one who fulfilled all right. I mean, we could just go on and on and on. But Paul said, those who aren't satisfied with the faithfulness of Christ, as that alone out from which a man who trusts in him is declared right, and those who don't get it, or if they get it, they reject that no kind of man is justified out from any kind of law, but rather out from the faithfulness of Christ, then he said, well, then let them be being, let them go through this process, which is impossible. God would not, God would not and has not. But you see what the appeal was. That was initially at the opening of his letter. He sets the theme, his thesis sentence is in their minds now, you can't say this word any longer without thinking of everything Jesus endured, his suffering, his anguish, uh, even when he was serving, he couldn't, at times he was so pressed, he couldn't even stop to extend his hand to take a bite of food, fasted 40 days and nights before he was uh, tested in the wilderness. He was constantly pursued, accused, People conspired against him. He's called into question. Legalists attended alongside of him so they might accuse, that is, categorize him because they knew he would heal on the Sabbath. They threatened to kill him on multiple times. They would take up stones to kill him, and yet he was faithful to continue to love and to carry out the righteous life that only he was willing and able to demonstrate, to live out, and by doing so, fulfill the righteousness of God. So it's quite a weighted term here when you suggest to, let's say, you know someone who's self-right, self-righteous, self-justified, that is, they're establishing their own righteousness, as Paul said, of religionists who rejected the righteousness of God, which is Jesus Christ, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, that God established through the life, death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the life he lived, and the death he died, and the resurrection, and being raised from the dead because of our justification. He said they go about to establish their own righteousness. Well, here in this letter, Galatians, the anathema alternative. So either you trust into Jesus for your everlasting life, simple act of faith. You either you get that no kind of man, and you understand it, and you're personally acquainted with the reality that no kind of man is justified out of any kind of law. You trust into this one. Your trust is there. We trust into him. And out from his faithfulness alone, that is the only source material, the only source reality, the only source of the establishment of the righteousness of God, the only definition of the righteousness of God, his Father. We trust in that we're declared right out from his faithfulness. And not out from our faithfulness, out from his faithfulness. So 
If you reject that, then Paul made the appeal that the believers there who, who knew of this. See, we were, we're affected. We are affected by the gospel, that good news, that story, that message of Jesus so favorably disposes us, so uh, favorably achieves in us the inclination, the being in favor. As Paul said, that we were called in a kind of favor from Christ that later in the letter he could say he was uh, that if they were to turn and go into the law to self-justify establish a basis for their own righteousness that they would fall out of that particular favor which was the one in which they were called but now he didn't say they'd fall out of Christ in this text here he's showing them there is no uh, kind of call from God that's in a kind of law. The call was in a kind of favor, a gracious favor, unmerited favor, and it says it's unmerited because there's nothing about it we could merit. So Paul said, let the one who has set aside the faithfulness of Christ, who's diminished the righteousness of God established by Jesus through his faithfulness, then let him be being this one upwardly positioned, this ongoing process now, it, it's just destruction. You remember, they were offering law, but they weren't really keeping law. So what was the alternative? It wasn't the law. These people didn't say, oh, I'm going to go live my life, and I'm going to start really studying the law. But, well, if you believe Moses, as Jesus said to the religionist, self-righteous ones in his lifetime, he said, if you believe Moses, but you didn't, then you would have believed into me, but you won't. So... The, 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 uh, the hypocrisy, the pretense here that he said we should purge out from among us, that old leaven, the leaven that Jesus warned us about, the Pharisees, the pretense, they're feigning and pretending something. So instead of Jesus, the law of Moses, they say, they weren't doing that. Instead of Jesus, let's make sure we follow Caesar. Instead of Jesus, let's make sure we acknowledge Abraham. And he said, if Abraham were your father, then you wouldn't be trying to kill me. And he said of Caesar, he said, well, then go give to him what is, go tribute to him what is owed to him and then give to God what's owed to him. So he detached the correlation between himself and Caesar. And he showed the contradiction between those who said they were of their father Abraham because they were trying to kill Jesus because he said Abraham longed to see his day. He also disclosed and showed their hypocrisy when they tried to contradict him and Moses when he said, well, if you did believe Moses, but you didn't, that's a conditional sentence where the condition is determined unfulfilled. So if you did, but you didn't, then you would have believed in me, but you won't. So in every point, he settled that. So in this case, he's just showing, Paul's telling the true alternative here is what these people are actually doing is if when you reject the faithfulness of Christ, which is the established righteousness of God, the definition of the righteousness of God, the fulfillment of all the righteousness of God, it's the fulfillment of all the law with all his heart, soul, mind. Then the only alternative is for you to be being this. But there's no such thing as that. There's no plan B in the Bible. And so someone says, well, won't something I do count? Outside of Christ, we are simply dead in sins and trespasses. And we are those who are fulfilling, only fulfilling the wills of both the mind and the flesh. Now, that's a fact. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, it says those outside of Christ Jesus, even our plowing is wicked. So we don't have anything, any meritorious action, whether it's something beneficial in this world's system or not, that has any contribution to our standing before God, only out from the faith of Christ. So that's enough, the anathema alternative. This is a very powerful uh, statement. And when Paul said it, it it gained their attention like it gains mine. And, uh, well, that's why I wanted to stop and pause and point this out. So you have a blessed day.